stifling evening hangs over us, the kind of summer night when the air seems too heavy to breathe. I glance around at my friends, Jess, Alex, and Kevin. We're laying about on the worn-out couch in Jess's basement. I've got an idea, Jess suddenly declares, disrupting the boredom-induced silence. Her eyes gleam with an idea, the kind of idea that usually leads to an adventure. She leans forward, her hands clasped together and whispers, How about we explore the old asylum? A collective gasp fills the room. The asylum, a relic of the past, shrouded in mystery and saturated with countless tales of hauntings and supernatural occurrences. Every local, young and old, knows about it. It's the kind of place parents warn their kids about. The kind of place that inspires spine-chilling campfire stories. You're not serious, are you? Alex blurred out, looking around to gauge our reactions. I'm as serious as a heart attack, Jess retorts, flashing him a challenging grin. But it's haunted, Kevin adds, the skepticism clear in his voice. Exactly, Jess replies, a note of triumph in her voice. Imagine the rush, the thrill, and if we document everything, think of the stories we'd have. Her enthusiasm is infectious. I can feel a buzz of excitement creeping up my spine. Despite the chilling rumors, the idea of a night-long adventure in the asylum feels enticingly thrilling. We've grown tired of our small town, and an adrenaline rush is precisely what we need. So what do you say? Jess presses on, looking at each of us. It's just a night. We go in when it's dark and we get out by dawn. We don't touch anything. We don't take anything. The room plunges into a tense silence as we mull over the idea. I glance at Kevin, who still looks apprehensive but not entirely dismissive. Alex seems lost in thought, possibly imagining what it would be like to be inside the asylum. I take a deep breath and despite my pounding heart, manage to say, Okay, I'm in. And even Kevin shrugs, mumbling a non-committal. Sure, why not? Jess beams at us, her eyes alight with triumph and a hint of uncontained excitement. That's the spirit, she says. It's going to be fun. The remainder of the evening is a flurry of excitement and nerves. We start preparing our survival kits, as Jess likes to call them. We need flashlights and plenty of batteries, Jess says, pacing around her room as we gather the essentials. Kevin, on the other hand, isn't too thrilled about the whole idea. He sits in a corner, eyebrows furrowed, scanning the local newspaper archives online. He's trying to gather information on the asylum, hoping to find something that might change our minds. You guys know that they shut it down after multiple unexplained deaths, right? He mutters, not looking up from his screen. But his warnings fall on deaf ears. We're too wrapped up in the thrill of the dare. Alex is preoccupied with setting up the cameras and audio recorders. We are going to document everything, he insists meticulously checking every piece of equipment. He looks excited. His eyes are wide with curiosity and intrigue. I take on the role of organizing our supplies. I pack bottled water, snacks, a first aid kit, and a few extra clothes into our backpacks. My hands are shaking slightly as the reality of what we're about to do starts to sink in. We each take a moment to write down notes in case we need to leave messages for each other. I also include a few Sharpies in my bag remembering the old ghost hunter's trick of marking our path. As the night grows darker, we gather around Jess's living room. She hands each of us a backpack, her eyes gleaming with a wild excitement that's almost contagious. You guys ready for this? She asks, her gaze lingering on each one of us. There's a pause, a brief moment of silence filled with uncertainty, excitement, and a tinge of fear. But we are all in this together, and there's no turning back now. So we respond with determined nods. As we trudge along the overgrown path leading to the asylum, the imposing silhouette of the structure looms before us. The asylum stands there, nestled amidst a thicket of skeletal trees, their bare branches casting spidery shadows that dance in the cold light of the moon. The asylum itself is a relic from a bygone era, a monument to the darkness of human history. Its once beautiful brick walls are now marred by years of decay and neglect. Ivy has reclaimed much of the outer walls, twisting and snaking its way through the cracked bricks. Devoid of glass, stare back at us like empty, soulless eyes. The building stretches out on either side. Towers punctuate the corners of the structure, their tall, eerie structures reaching out into the starless sky. The large double doors at the entrance hang off their hinges. Above the entrance, the faded letters still spell out the institution's name. As we step closer, the sense of unease grows. 
It's not just the sight of the decrepit building, but the silence. A suffocating heavy stillness that seems almost unnatural. It feels as if the asylum is holding its breath. We exchange anxious glances, bracing ourselves for the night of exploration that lies ahead. The rusty hinges of the asylum's massive double doors groan in protest as Jess pushes them open. An icy gust of wind rushes out to greet us, carrying with it the musty smell of decay, the scent of old paper, and a faint metallic tang. We share a collective shiver, then gathering our courage, step over the threshold. Our flashlights slice through the consuming darkness, revealing a grand entrance hall that has seen better days. Cracked tiles spread out beneath our feet, each step echoing in the large space. The faded remains of once opulent wallpaper hang off the walls. To our left, a wide, sweeping staircase looms in the dark, its banister polished smooth by the hands of countless patients. The stairs disappear into the shadowy floor. To our right, an array of closed doors line the corridor, their dark wooden frames stained with age. Some are slightly ajar. Straight ahead, a large reception desk stands, its surface cluttered with piles of yellowed paperwork and a vintage telephone. Behind it, rows upon rows of rusty metal letterboxes hang on the wall, each one labeled with a patient's name. Jess is the first to decide our route. Let's start with the ground floor, she suggests, her voice echoing through the grim entrance hall. We can work our way up. There are nods of agreement, the rest of us too caught up in the eeriness of our surroundings to argue. We take a right, moving away from the grand staircase and towards the line of dark foreboding doors leading off from the main hall. The doors are weathered and worn, each one bearing a plaque with a faded inscription, examination room, therapy, and records. The first door creaks open to reveal what was once the examination room. Old medical equipment lies discarded. Dusty jars with unrecognizable contents line the shelves, and an old rusted examination table stands in the center, its leather surface cracked and torn. Next we venture into what was once a therapy room. A circle of dilapidated chairs huddle in the middle, their fabric faded and tattered. On one wall a chalkboard hangs, the remnants of diagrams and notes still faintly visible. The records room is our final stop on the ground floor. Rows upon rows of cabinets stretch out before us. After exploring some of the ground floor, we decide to check out the second floor. The staircase, though sturdy, groans under our weight, the echo reverberating ominously through the building. The upper floor opens up to a long, narrow corridor lined with what used to be patient rooms. Look at this, Alex murmurs as we step into the first room. The camera around his neck swings back and forth. He's pointing at a wall covered in peeling wallpaper. Beneath the paper, faint pencil markings can be seen, a crude drawing of a tree and a series of numbers. Patience must have drawn this, he speculates, his voice filled with a strange mix of excitement and unease. Kevin, ever the skeptic, shrugs, or it was bored squatters. His joke falls flat, the oppressive atmosphere swallowing the humor. I notice his knuckles whitening on the flashlight. We move to another room. This one is smaller, with a single window that overlooks the desolate grounds. Jess is the first to notice the stains on the mattress, dark blotches that spread like an abstract painting. She swallows hard. Let's keep moving, she says, her voice sounding slightly strained. Wait, I whisper, picking up a small tattered journal from a dusty side table. It's a diary, I explain, flipping it open to a random page. The entries are rushed and the handwriting is shaky, full of desperation and fear. I read out a line. They don't understand. The shadows, they whisper at night. A shiver runs down my spine as I snap the diary shut. Probably a patience, Alex suggests, his camera lens capturing the moment. This place, it's a lot sadder than I thought it'd be. We're not here for fun, remember? Jess reminds us, though her voice lacks its usual determination. She seems far away, lost in thought, her gaze fixed on the dirty, stained window. No, we're here because we're stupid, Kevin mutters under his breath, but loud enough for us to hear. A silence follows, heavy and thick, as we realize how far we've delved into the heart of the asylum. The laughter and thrill-seeking from earlier seem distant now, replaced by the eerie whisperings of the past and a growing sense of foreboding that we can't seem to shake off. 
As we continue our exploration, we stumble upon a large faded sign hanging over a heavy door that reads, Children's Ward. Jess turns the doorknob. With a soft creak, the door swings open and we step into a world frozen in time. The children's ward is hauntingly still, a shadow of the once lively space it must have been. Rows of small, rusty iron beds line the room, their mattresses rotted and discolored. Each is draped with a moth-eaten blanket, the fabric tattered and faded. A few of the beds still have dusty, neglected toys sitting on top. A one-eyed teddy bear, a wooden top, and a broken doll. A peeling mural decorates one of the walls, depicting a cheerful sun and a vibrant rainbow, a stark contrast to the gloom that now engulfs the room. Faded drawings created by tiny hands are pinned to a corkboard. Their faded colors and innocent joy are a reminder of the children who once resided here. Near the corner, there's a small desk. An open ledger rests on it. The ink on the pages are long faded, but the neatly scribbled names and dates are still visible. The latest entry is dated almost 70 years back. Despite the thick layer of dust and the obvious signs of decay, there's an eeriness that hangs in the air, a sense of lingering sadness. A chill sweeps across the room, making us shudder. It's not just the cold, but the realization that this place, once filled with the sounds of children, is now a haunting evidence of their suffering. Suddenly, a hushed whisper moves through the room, so soft that it almost blends with the wind outside. We freeze and our eyes meet in the dim light of our flashlights. Did you guys hear that? Alex asks, his eyes wide. We all nod. I'm sure it's just the wind, Kevin quickly counters, a hint of uncertainty lurking beneath his voice. We don't argue, but the unsettled expressions on our faces reveal our shared skepticism. Not long after, we start noticing shadowy figures flickering at the corners of our eyes. They disappear as soon as we turn our heads leaving us questioning if we actually saw anything. Jess catches one on her camera, a blurry form lurking in the background of an image. When she shows us, we all fall silent, the dread sinking in. Objects begin to move on their own. A rusted wheelchair rolls across the room, its squeaky wheels sending chills down our backs. A door we had left open slammed shut with a deafening bang. We find objects misplaced, things we hadn't touched shifting their locations. It's just our minds playing tricks, Kevin insists, his voice shaky. His eyes dart around nervously, betraying his words. It's dark. We're tired and scared. We're just imagining things. We can't shake the unease that's settled over us. The asylum doesn't feel just abandoned anymore. As we keep exploring the asylum, the atmosphere grows increasingly oppressive. Echoes of laughter and crying are heard. The sounds warped and distorted as if coming from a great distance. The temperature drops drastically in certain spots, and our breath mists in the cold air. We find ourselves standing before a large, double-doored operating theater, its observation gallery filled with rows of decaying seats. As we step inside, a blinding light suddenly flickers on, illuminating the rusted surgical table and antiquated medical instruments. Our hearts pound in our chests as the light abruptly goes out, plunging us back into darkness. Walking into the former dormitories, we hear the distinct clatter of bed frames as if someone or something is moving restlessly. In the solitary confinement rooms, we hear the walls reverberating with low, mournful wails. Shadows seem to gather and dissipate, forming human-like shapes before vanishing into thin air. Is it just me, or do you guys feel watched too? Alex murmurs, his voice shaky as he scans the darkened hallway with his camera. We all nod, admitting to the same unease. Our laughter and skepticism have completely evaporated, replaced by an unsettling dread. Deciding to push on, we approach the end of a particularly long corridor when we hear a gasp. Spinning around, we realize Alex is gone. Alex, Jess calls out, her voice echoing ominously, but there's no response. The only evidence that Alex was there is his camera lying on the ground where he stood. I reach down to pick it up and put it around my neck. We stare at each other the gravity of the situation sinking in. Let's split up, Kevin suggests, his voice edged with panic. We can cover more ground that way. Jess shakes her head vehemently. No way. That's how people disappear in horror movies, remember? We stick together. We start with the nearest rooms, pushing open creaky doors and shining our flashlights into gloomy corners. Every room is a snapshot from the past. Decrepit beds, broken dressers, 
wallpaper peeling off in long strips, but no sign of Alex. We venture down the long, winding corridors, and our calls for Alex cut through the oppressive silence. We explore the communal bathrooms, their cracked tiles and rusted fixtures adding to the eerie atmosphere. Still, Alex remains missing. His camera, still around my neck, feels like a heavy weight. I fumble to turn it on, hoping it might provide a clue. Skimming through the photos, there's nothing out of the ordinary except for a picture of a door at the end of a corridor. It's the last photo that was taken. Guys, I think I know where he might be, I say, showing them the photo. We follow the path captured in the picture. It leads us to a secluded wing of the asylum, past the recreational area now filled with broken equipment and overgrown weeds. We walk through the remnants of the kitchen. Finally, we reach the door from the photograph. The sign above it reads, Hydrotherapy. With a collective intake of breath, we push it open, and there, in the middle of the room, huddled against the remnants of a rusted tub, we find Alex. Is as real as the fear that had gripped us moments ago, but relief quickly turns into concern as we take in Alex's pale face and wide, terror-stricken eyes. Something truly terrifying has happened to him in this room, something that has left him in a state of shock. As we rush toward Alex, Jess is the first to reach him. She kneels beside him, her hand trembling as she touches his shoulder, her voice filled with concern. Alex doesn't respond immediately. He just stares at us, his eyes wide and fearful, his breath shallow. He looks as though he has seen the embodiment of fear itself. Alex, you have to tell us what happened, Kevin implores, his usually confident demeanor replaced by genuine worry. We can't help if we don't know. I crouch down, looking at him. Did someone do this to you? I ask, trying to meet his gaze. Or something. Finally, Alex swallows hard, his eyes flicking between us. I was chased. He stammers out, his voice a mere whisper. There was a woman. A woman? Jess repeats, her eyes wide. You mean a ghost? Alex nods slowly, his gaze distant. She looked like one of the patients here. Her eyes were hollow, empty, and the way she moved, it was unnatural. Kevin, though visibly shaken, is quick to respond. Alex, are you sure it wasn't a prank or maybe your mind playing tricks? No, Kevin, Alex replies, shaking his head. I know what I saw and it... It wasn't human. We exchange glances. The silence is heavy in the room, even Kevin doesn't argue this time. Instead, he stands up, pacing back and forth as he runs a hand through his hair. Jess and Jess move closer to Alex, offering silent support. Then Jess finally breaks the silence. We can't panic, she says, her voice remarkably steady despite the tremor I can see in her hands. Panic won't help us. Jess glances at her, her brows furrowing. But Jess, she says, her voice nearly a whisper. We're in an abandoned asylum with what seems to be actual ghosts. How can we not panic? Jess pauses, drawing a deep breath. Because we need to stay rational. We decided we'd stay here until morning, right? She looks at each of us, her gaze resolute. So we stick to the plan. Kevin raises an eyebrow, the flicker of skepticism clear on his face, even after what happened to Alex. I want to stay, he murmurs, surprising all of us. I mean, it was terrifying, yeah, but we came here to document the unknown, didn't we? That's exactly what we're doing. His words hang in the air, casting a new perspective on our dilemma. I agree with Alex, I find myself saying, earning surprised looks from everyone. We wanted to know what was here, and we found something. We should see it through. All right, then, Jess finally says, determination flaring in her eyes. We stick together, we stay calm, and we make it until morning. But remember, our safety comes first. If anything feels too dangerous, we get out immediately. Deal? There's a moment of silence before we all nod in agreement. We leave the hydrotherapy room, heading deeper into the asylum. The walls are a patchwork of peeling paint and mildew. Broken windows let in cold gusts of wind, carrying with them the musty smell of decay and the distant hoots of an owl. We should check the east wing, Jess suggests, her voice wavering slightly. As we wander through the hallways of the asylum, we stick together, keep our steps cautious, and our breaths held in anticipation. Guys, look at this, Jess says, pointing her flashlight at a spot where the peeling paint reveals the edge of a door. Intrigued, we move closer. This seems like a hidden door, Jess whispers. My heart pounds in my chest as I reach out, tracing the outline of the concealed door. It's cleverly masked, almost seamlessly blended with the crumbling wall. 
My hand finds the cool metal of an old-fashioned doorknob, almost swallowed by layers of paint. With a deep breath, I turn it. There's a creaking noise, and the door swings open to reveal a small room. I swallow the lump in my throat. Guys, I say, my voice echoing in the silent corridor. I think we've just found something big. As we step into the room, our flashlights illuminate the dusty corners, revealing shelves filled with old cardboard boxes and forgotten items. We fan out, our footsteps echoing softly as we begin our exploration. Shelves line the room, filled with weathered cardboard boxes. Jess moves towards one, pulling it open. Clouds of dust rise into the air, causing her to cough. Carefully, she pulls out a stack of old files. These are... Oh my God, Jess murmurs, her eyes scanning the contents of the files. We gather around her, our own explorations forgotten. Her hand trembles slightly as she holds up a black and white photograph. It's a patient, she says. Look. In the dim light, we peer at the image. A woman stares back at us, her eyes hollow, her face etched with despair. It's an unsettling sight, but it's the documents accompanying the photograph that chill us to the bone. Medical reports, treatment plans, detailed sketches of invasive procedures, therapies involving electricity and water, and surgeries done without proper anesthesia. Jess's fingers gingerly flip through the yellowed pages, her eyes scanning the meticulous handwritten notes. Her voice breaks the eerie silence. Patient 63, she begins, her voice low and shaky. Suffered from hallucinations and insomnia, was administered electroconvulsive therapy without anesthesia. A pause, a horrified intake of breath. The report says the patient convulsed violently and bit his own tongue, but was successfully pacified. A shudder ripples through us. I see Alex close his eyes as if trying to block out the vivid images appearing in his mind. But Jess is not done. She turns a page, the paper rustling sharply in the silence. Here's another one, she says. Patient 48, diagnosed with schizophrenia, underwent an experimental procedure, a lobotomy. The doctor inserted a thin, pointed tool through the corner of the patient's eye, she reads, her voice catching on the horrifying details. The tool was then hammered into the frontal lobe to calm the patient's excessive emotional responses. Her voice trails off as she takes in the accompanying sketches, and her face goes pale. The room is silent, except for the soft whimpers Jess tries to suppress. The clinical language of the reports does nothing to diminish the sheer horror of the treatments. Each word paints a vivid picture in our minds. The suffering they endured, Jess whispers, her voice echoing our thoughts. It's unimaginable, and it truly is. The records paint a grisly picture of the asylum's history. A place not of healing, but of inhumane experiments and unending torment. I think these are the spirits we've been seeing. Jess murmurs, holding up a photograph of a woman whose hollow eyes match the description Alex gave earlier. A chill runs down my spine at her words. Suddenly the whispers we've been hearing seem louder, the temperature drops further, and the sense of being watched intensifies, as if the spirits are aware that we've discovered their past. Without warning, a violent gust of wind sweeps through the room and papers scatter everywhere. We hear a low, agonizing wail, and then pain. I feel a sharp sting on my arm and look down to see three deep scratches on my left forearm, and blood starts to slowly well up. Kevin screams in pain next, clutching his ankle, while Jess gasps, her cheeks suddenly bearing a bright red mark. Only Jess remains unscathed. Her eyes are wide as she takes in the scene. As fear finally breaks her composed mask, we nod, too shocked to argue. We all nod. Leaving the hidden room behind, we step back into the gloomy corridor. Its eeriness is amplified now. As we head towards the stairs, something strange stops us in our tracks. The door to the stairs that was previously open is now closed. Kevin reaches it first, grabbing the doorknob and yanking, but the door doesn't budge. What the, he mumbles, confusion etching lines on his forehead. He gives it another hard yank, and then another, but the door remains closed. A sense of dread washes over us as we rush to check the other doors. The result is the same every time, locked. Even the windows, previously broken and gaping, now have iron bars covering them. It's as if the asylum has sealed itself shut, trapping us inside. Okay, this can't be happening, Jess whispers, her face pale. We were just in these rooms. The doors weren't locked. But they are now, Jess says, her voice eerily calm amid the rising panic. The asylum, it doesn't want us to leave. 
We exchanged terrified glances, the implications of our predicament dawning on us. We're trapped inside the asylum, the doors locked as if by an unseen force, a force that doesn't want us to leave. We have to split up, Jess suggests, her voice shaky. Search for any way out, we can't just sit here. Nods of agreement follow and we spread out. I find myself heading towards the east wing of the asylum. The corridor here is narrower. The dim light from my flashlight dances off the cracked tiles. The once cheerful pastel-colored walls are now cloaked in a thick layer of dust and decay. The silence is oppressive, broken only by the echoing drip of water somewhere in the distance. It feels as if the very walls are holding their breath and watching me. I pass closed doors with rusted metal nameplates. As I walk, I can't help but imagine the patient's stories, the people they were, the horrors they must have faced within these very walls. I come across an old rotting wooden door. The paint is chipped and the metal knob is cold under my fingers. As I push it open, the hinges creak, breaking the haunting silence. I step inside and my flashlight beam cuts through the darkness. It's a small room. Perhaps it was a patient's room once. A rusted metal bed frame stands in the corner. Old faded wallpaper peels off from the damp walls, and a broken window allows the moonlight to filter in, casting long, eerie shadows. In the far corner of the room, a wooden desk stands against the wall. Time has not been kind to it. The wood is rotten and warped, but on it, I see something that makes my heart skip a beat. A rusty key, half hidden under a pile of old crumbling papers. Could this be our way out? My hand shakes as I reach out and pick up the key. A ray of hope flickers in my chest. As I leave the room, my steps feel a bit lighter. My ray of hope is extinguished when I suddenly hear a scream echoing through the corridors. The asylum turns into a blur as I run as fast as I can toward where the screams originated. The flashlight bounces in my hand, casting wild shadows on the rotting walls. I round a corner and skid to a stop, and my heart plummets. There I see Jess, Jess and Alex, their faces pale and their eyes wide with shock, and on the ground near a maintenance hatch, alarmingly still, is Kevin. I rush towards him. My knees hit the hard, cold floor with a thud as I kneel beside him. His eyes are closed, his face alarmingly pale under the light. Jess is crying. Alex stands a little ways off, his face a mask of shock. Jess is the only one who moves, reaching out to check Kevin's pulse, her hand shaking. We wait in terrible silence, each passing second stretching into an eternity. Finally, Jess pulls her hand away. He's gone, she whispers, the words barely audible. For a moment, all is silent except for Jess's quiet sobs. We settle down against a cold, peeling wall, the uneven surface digging into our backs. The long, torturous hours stretch on as we wait for dawn. Each tick of the clock seems to take away a piece of our hope, leaving us in an ever-deepening pit of despair. I'm jolted awake by the sound of voices echoing through the corridors and the harsh glare of lights that permeate my eyelids. Squinting against the brightness, I sit up as confusion clouds my mind. My eyes adjust, and I see figures bustling around us, their outlines blurred in my groggy state. Hey, we got three more here, a voice booms through the halls of the asylum. I shield my eyes as a flashlight beam sweeps over us. There's a rapid sound of footsteps and suddenly we are surrounded. It takes me a moment to register the navy blue uniforms and the badges. It's the police. They're here. We're safe. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. I shake Jess and Alex awake. They blink groggily at the sudden invasion of our huddled sanctuary. The officers help us to our feet. Their face is a mix of relief and concern. One of them, a tall woman with a stern face, sits us down and hands us each a blanket. She introduces herself as Officer Johnson and tells us that they were called to check out the asylum. An early morning jogger noticed the broken entrance and gave us a call. We weren't sure what we would find, she explains, her voice softening a bit. It's a good thing they did. Who knows what could have happened if we didn't find you. As paramedics arrive to examine us, the weight of the night's horrors starts to lift slightly. But as relief washes over us, the image of Kevin alone and lifeless on that cold, hard floor sears into my mind. Our nightmare might have ended, but it had left a lasting scar. We're led out of the asylum, and as we step outside, the sun in the morning sky stings my eyes. It's a world away from the suffocating darkness we'd just left behind. 
My senses feel heightened. The morning breeze on my skin feels too raw. The distant chatter of the officers is too loud. Everything outside feels too real, too solid compared to the horrors we'd faced inside the asylum. We need to seal this place off, Officer Johnson says. Nobody should ever step foot in there again. Her words ring in my ears as we are escorted toward the waiting ambulance. I steal a glance back at the asylum. Its towering structure casts a shadow that seems to reach out toward us. The tall barred windows stare back. Vacant yet filled with a thousand untold stories. Its silence is almost eerie in the bright daylight. As I'm loaded into the ambulance, a paramedic gently places an oxygen mask over my mouth. Jess and Alex are already inside. Their faces are pale and vacant. Their eyes reflect the same haunting images I know are burned into my mind. Kevin's lifeless body, the shadowy figures, the chilling whispers, they're all there, lingering in our shared silence. We are driven away from the asylum, leaving it behind in a cloud of dust. In the aftermath, our experience is dismissed as a tragic accident. Kevin's death is deemed a consequence of the deteriorated building, an unfortunate accident. No one believes our accounts of the night. The asylum is sealed off permanently, its legacy only living on through whispers in the town and our scarred memories. We are left with the weight of our loss and the torment of what we've witnessed. The memories of the asylum haunt us, a chilling reminder of the horrifying night we spent in the company of the lost souls. Our lives move on, but our experiences remain, trapped in the recesses of our minds like the spirits in the asylum. I never imagined I'd be living out in the middle of nowhere, much less in a run-down old farmhouse I found on the cheap. But I had wanted a fresh start, and when I inherited a little money after my dad died, getting out of the city seemed like the perfect plan. The past year had been hard on me. Losing dad, breaking up with my longtime girlfriend, and getting laid off all within a few months of each other left me feeling lost and alone. The grief counselor I had been seeing told me a change of scenery could help shift my perspective. So on a whim, I decided to search for houses in rural areas outside the city. That's how I stumbled upon the property listing for the Rosewood Farm Estate. The photos showed an aged but stately farmhouse set on 20 acres of wooded land, about 45 minutes outside the city limits. It had originally caught my eye due to the cheap price tag, way below market value. The place was certainly outdated, with floral wallpaper and decades-old appliances, but it had potential. I fell in love with the wraparound porch looking out over the lush forest behind the house. It seemed like an enchanting place to have a fresh start. The cheap price was due to the recent death of the previous elderly owner, and the seller was an out-of-state relative just wanting a fast sale, so I jumped on it. When I made the drive out to see the property for the first time, the place seemed even more charming than the photos. The ambiance of the forest around it was incredible. Inside, the place was musty but quaint with a classic farmhouse layout and quirky little details. I started imagining myself living there, sipping tea on the porch while looking out at the autumn leaves, maybe getting a cat or two, just enjoying the solitude and taking long walks through those amazing woods it felt meant to be. It took about a month between closing on the place, packing up my tiny apartment, and officially moving in. The first week was mainly unpacking, trying to clean a quarter century's worth of dust and spiders out of the corners and making endless hardware store trips for odds and ends. I didn't mind, though. I almost enjoyed making the place slowly become more my own. I slept on an inflatable mattress in what was now my bedroom, while hunting Craigslist for cheap second-hand furniture. I even liked the creaks and groans of the old house settling at night. It felt comforting somehow. By the eighth night, I had finally cleared enough clutter out of what would be my study to set up my laptop and desk. The musty room still needed a lot more work, but just having a space to write and chill with music or podcasts felt huge. I found myself gazing out the study's window into the darkness of the woods beyond. The moonlight made the trees look like jagged cutouts against the black sky. As a breeze passed, the entire forest swayed in hypnotic unison. It was the first time I paused to consider how vastly the acres of untamed wilderness dwarfed my house. I suddenly wondered what was even out there. I decided to skip unpacking for a chance to explore my new backyard forest. 
The autumn chill bit through my light sweater as I wandered slowly into the tree line. My boots crunched satisfyingly through a carpet of orange and brown leaves. It felt straight out of a fairy tale, with golden beams of sunlight slicing the canopy overhead and tiny birds flitting to and fro. Squirrels and chipmunks scattered at my approach. The light smell of moss and damp earth surrounded me. I weaved between the towering oaks and maples without any clear direction or purpose. I just wanted to walk and admire it all. Before I knew it, an hour had passed, just wandering aimlessly through the woods. I probably should have paid more attention to where I was headed in case I got lost. But I could still catch glimpses of the house through the trees, so I knew I was fine. When a small clearing opened up ahead, I stepped into it, taking in the view. It felt like a little secret sanctuary, an island of vibrant green grass surrounded by crimson and amber leaves. I crossed the tiny field, planning to complete a loop back to the yard, but on the far side I froze. Half hidden under a layer of soggy leaves and forest debris was what looked like the entrance to an old tunnel, ringed in crumbling brick. Strange. I didn't recall seeing this on any property maps when I had purchased the place. I moved closer, fascinated. Kneeling down and brushing plant debris aside revealed a narrow passageway lined with concrete leading down under the ground at an angle. Just inside I could make out a rusted iron rung ladder descending further into darkness. My heart quickened with curiosity, wondering where this bizarre tunnel led. Glancing at my phone showed no service this deep in the woods to call the cellar and ask. The tunnel clearly seemed man-made though, so maybe it had historical value? Or what if it was something more sensitive like Cold War infrastructure? My mind raced and I knew I had to at least peek inside. Pulling out my phone's flashlight, I carefully stepped over the eroded entrance. My boots echoed down the concrete tube as I placed them on the first few rungs of the straining to see where it led. A nervous exhilaration tingled through me. Leaning further in, a waft of cold, stale air hit my face from below. Just a quick look, I told myself, just to satisfy my curiosity of whatever this mysterious tunnel was. Taking a deep breath, I descended into the darkness. Using my phone's flashlight, I follow the tunnel further underground. The ladder descends at least twenty more feet at a steep incline before opening into a larger concrete room. Stepping down from the last rung, I shine my light around, taking it all in. The underground bunker looks straight out of a Cold War thriller movie set. Harsh concrete walls curve up to meet a low ceiling with exposed pipes and vents. Rows of shelves still hold dusty boxes and large jugs marked with faded chemical names. One wall has floor-to-ceiling stacks of shrink-wrapped pallets that look like food ration bundles from some apocalypse prepper. I walk slowly along the shelves, examining containers and canisters, but having no clue what half this stuff really is. Was someone running a lab down here at some point? Or maybe it was meant as a fallout shelter during nuclear tensions with the Soviets. A thick layer of dust covers everything, though, hinting that no one has been down here in ages. I snap some photos on my phone, but of course there's still no service to send them to anyone. Continuing my exploration down the rows, I enter into what looks like an old common area or break room filled with simple cots and tables. Dusty books and magazines litter some of the surfaces, looking straight out of another era. A quick glance at a yellowed newspaper headline confirms at least parts of this bunker date back to the mid-1960s. Crazy to think this time capsule has just been sitting forgotten under the woods this whole time. Makes me wonder what else might still be hidden down other tunnels. I set my phone on a table to cast some ambient light around the room, then move to try opening one of the large metal lockers along the wall. The latch squeals from decades of disuse as I pry it open. Inside sits neatly folded sets of heavy canvas clothes that look vaguely military, but with no insignia or name tags. Rifling through the piles uncovers no other clues of the bunker's original purpose. Hopefully there are more clues deeper within. Closing up that locker, I search for what section to explore next. Some open doorways at the far side of the room catch my eye. That way seems to lead even deeper into the underground maze. I flick my flashlight beam over, but the darkness gives no hint to what might lie beyond that threshold. An uneasy tightness forms in my chest. Maybe wandering into those unlit corridors alone isn't the smartest plan. Then again, 
When will I ever get a chance to freely poke around a time capsule bunker under my own backyard again? Curiosity pushes me onwards. My footsteps echo off the concrete, sounding abnormally loud as I cross the large common space toward the doorway. Passing the last set of cots, my boot catches a half-unfolded blanket draped between the bed frames. I stumble, trying not to faceplant as I kick loose from the woven snare. My elbow crashes hard into a small shelving cart beside me in an effort to stay upright. The metal racks topple to the floor with a tremendous clatter, amplified by the concrete walls around me. I wince as the echoes of the crash fade back to silence. A nervous embarrassment washes over me, and I find myself whispering sorry to no one, as if I was caught snooping here. I let out an awkward little laugh at myself as I righted the fallen cart, making sure I didn't break anything before gently setting it back into place. No harm done, just gotta watch my step down here. Collecting my phone light again, I continue making my way toward the inner doorway across the room. As I step through the threshold into the dark corridor beyond, the piercing crash echoes back through the rooms again, repeating endlessly from every direction until dissipating once more. The sheer emptiness in this place lets even the smallest disruption reverberate for ages. As the last distorted echoes fade off down the pitch passages, a sinking discomfort settles into my chest. I glance back over my shoulder towards the way I had entered. The depths now seem menacing, like a lurking presence. Had exploring this abandoned bunker alone really been such a brilliant idea? That persistent reverberation didn't sound as innocuous anymore, now almost mimicking distant footsteps chasing me down into this underground maze. A nervous impulse presses me to turn back, to leave this place undisturbed with its mysteries intact before something happens. I force an embarrassed laugh at myself yet again, annoyed that I'm letting simple acoustic effects rattle me. It's all just empty halls and shadows down here. Once I've satisfied my curiosity a little more, I can follow my own echo trail right back out. Taking a deep breath, I raise my flashlight and proceed cautiously down the hall, peering into each new room or storage area as I pass. Many contain similar dusty shelves and lockers like the first spaces, while others seem more actively ransacked. One appears to have been a security command post once, judging by the gutted control panels and surveillance screens. Evidence is mounting that military or government personnel definitely utilized this bunker extensively at some point. I snap more photos of the dated equipment, though they don't help yield more specific clues about the actual former purpose or current ownership of this place. At a T-split in the passage, I randomly turn right following the corridor until I arrive at another large chamber that may have served as barracks or dorms once. Inside is a grid of more basic cots, alongside battered footlockers at the end of each bed. I set down my phone again, casting a hub of light amid the eight empty beds, so I could most contain a few mundane personal artifacts like worn socks, water-stained books, and a deck of cards, but no ID tags or anything to put names to those who stayed here. One trunk near the back does house what looks like a folder of paperwork. Taking it to the nearest cot under the light, I gently peel open the crumbling file. Diagrams of pneumatic chemistry equipment and molecular structures fill each curled page. Scattered sentences refer to observational studies of the effects of some compound labeled MBX-893, whatever that implies. Coming across redacted names and several top-secret stamps leaves me even more confused but also increasingly wary about blatantly nosing through potentially classified documents down here. A smaller side office branches off from the open barracks, so I migrate there next, locating a heavy desktop phone that I lift to check for a dial tone. Of course, the line is long dead, if it ever even connected to the outside world. Riffling the drawers reveals an eclectic collection of confiscated goods like switchblades, a flask, and what may be human molars in a small jar but again no helpful idea of whose bizarre collection this was. My main light starts to gently flicker then, signaling my phone battery is running low after an hour below ground. A fresh trickle of unease goes down my spine. No other visible light sources exist down here should mine fail completely. Outside, what pale beam might filter through from the surface exits so far back? I need to wrap this up soon and get above ground before I'm plunged into darkness. Crossing back through the maze of rooms and corridors, 
I decide exploring just one more chamber won't hurt, choosing another partially caved-in storage bay. Carefully climbing past the fallen beams and debris blocking most of the shelving, I brush the dust from some unbroken bottles to read their peeling labels. But the chemical names offer no more hints about this place than anything else I've found so far. My impatience for answers grows as I move deeper into the room, shoving stacks of moldy cardboard boxes aside. Passing the small dust cloud reveals the back corner filled with larger items covered under thick canvas tarps. Now we're getting somewhere. These could be vehicles, machines, or anything more obviously informative than endless shelves of anonymous crates that all look frustratingly identical. Striding over, I yank back the corner of the nearest tarp to reveal the parameters of what appears to be mechanical equipment. Did they have some kind of backup generator system running down here? Straining for a better grip on the stiff canvas, I try peeling it back further when my overzealous tugging overbalances a small pile. I leap aside just as the heavy stack crashes over. The sound thunders through the concrete chamber like a grenade blast. My heart hammers as I stand frozen for a long few seconds, listening to the grating echoes distort, then fade away. A nervous laugh escapes me yet again. Guess I'm being overly jumpy, not used to having my own noises echo back so harshly, playing tricks in this sensory-deprived place. I just need to rein in the careless impulse before I knock something more dangerous over onto myself. I move to start recovering the equipment when the echoes return, cascading from every direction to converge back upon me like ripples in a vast subterranean pond. But this repeat distortion sounds different, more random and arrhythmic than my initial impact. My skin prickles as my instincts try to process the out-of-place noise my conscious brain hasn't caught up on yet. Finally it hits me. Among the sounds are the echoes of, of something else moving in this underground space. My lungs turn to ice as I scan the darkness pressing in around me. Those extra echoes sounded almost like footsteps somewhere in the distance, as if something else had been startled by my noisy disruption and is now on the move. But that would mean my eyes dart towards the room's doorway just as a muffled scraping comes from the corridor shadows. Something is definitely out there. Maybe a smaller animal took shelter down here from the surface. But why haven't I noticed rats or bats or anything else living in an abandoned bunker until the moment I make a racket? I inch sideways, groping for my swaying flashlight beam. My stomach drops, spotting how dangerously dim the light has faded. Dread churns through me at being trapped in darkness with whatever else skulks in this concrete catacomb. Especially if that something seems more unsettled by my trespassing than afraid itself. The scrapes sound again down the hall, perhaps circling nearer. My chest tightens until each breath strains against the panic rising up my throat. Cold logic battles my racing imagination over what I've actually seen evidence of so far versus what ghastly possibilities my adrenaline-soaked mind can conjure up out of gnawing fear and blind belief. Maybe some malnourished feral hound went wild after being abandoned down here ages ago. So what kind of animal could physically survive this long and subterranean isolation? A muffled impact against something solid echoes from the passageway, followed by a hair-raising grating noise fading into the distance again. Okay, yeah, no more hypothetical excuses. Something with mass is definitely moving around out there reacting to my presence. My hands tremble around the flashlight, willing it to shine brighter through this never-ending tension. I sweep the feeble beam towards the room's opening, just as a gut-churning metallic screech shrieks down the hallway. A primal spike of pure terror shoots through me at the sheer wrongness of the sound no earthly creature could or should make. The implied thing moves closer, its scrape clicks, warping in and out of a nerve-shredding randomness. No pack animal could mimic. This place is not abandoned. Something feral and unfathomable is in this bunker, too and I've trespassed obliviously into its domain. Escaping is my only defense now. I abandon the equipment and scramble back over the debris, no longer caring for stealth or secrecy. Navigating the ruins by memory and touch, I reach the room's opening just as my light flickers and then finally dies. Submerging me in the void. Blind instinct takes over as I race through the corridors, one hand tracing along the wall, desperate to outrun the thing somewhere behind me in the darkness. Each shuffling of its movement tears all rational thought away. Deafening heartbeats fill my ears, drowning out any other sense. Filtered through gripping panic, 
The creature's erratic movement almost resembles the frantic of something trying to escape from an even greater threat that has my scent now. Rounding the last corner, I barrel towards where I pray the exit ladder lies waiting. Behind me echo the alien footsteps of something no longer bothering to hide its pursuit. Then, ten feet from freedom suddenly, my shoulder slams brutally into an unseen shelf, sending me crashing to the floor as what's left of my rational mind recognizes I've misjudged the distance in blindness. New instinct takes over as I curl into a quivering ball rather than stagger up to flee again. Maybe it will lose track of me for precious seconds if I hold utterly still and noiseless. Either way, escaping is impossible when I'll only run into more debris before ever finding the way out. Fighting back is equally hopeless. Now cowering in petrified silence is my only pathetic defense against the horror shuffling ever nearer through the dark. Each dragging rasp of its irregular walk strips further layers of courage away, until nothing remains except weeping primordial terror. Eons seem to pass, measured in pounding heartbeats. My sanity hangs by a thread, praying it loses interest. Until a deafening crash blasts through the blackness as something massive topples nearby. A howl, unlike any animal, tears from my lungs. I've never made a noise like that in my life. My heart pounds as I hear heavy footsteps approaching. Nothing about the pattern suggests normal human motion. Survival alarms blare in my brain, demanding I hide from whatever this thing is. I duck behind some shelves just as a shape emerges from the pooling darkness. Crouched low between the cold metal racks, I contain my breathing, praying my scent or noise goes unnoticed. The heavy steps traverse past my hiding place, accompanied by a vicious dragging hiss against the floor. When the shuffling mass of the creature at last passes into my sightline between the shelves, the visual reality proves infinitely worse than speculation. Covered in translucent skin slick with oozing slime, it reveals contorted muscles flexing strangely beneath. It towers twice my height, hunched forward under a cloak of stringy hair, obscuring all facial features save a gaping mouth lined with black teeth. Skinny arms sprout extra joints, ending in curving claws that scrape with each step. Most disturbing of all, sunken deep under that greasy veil of hair, lie two large, smooth expanses of flesh where eyes should reside. No pupils, lids, or sockets are to be seen, just wide patches of tissue surrounded by scars. It's totally blind, yet somehow still keenly tracking my presence only by scent and sound. Disgust and horror root me in place as the creature creeps past. When at last the creatures move out of view down the next corridor, I huddle gasping behind the shelves, struggling to reconcile reality with what I've just seen. The minutes crawl by, straining to detect any hint over my own wheezing breath that still lingers nearby. But only void answers. Relief battles churning nausea. I've survived undetected, but for how long? I'm outmatched in strength and sensory ability underground. My only path is escape. I pull out my phone to orient towards the surface, but no signal or GPS exists this deep in the bunker. Had I even retained enough mental faculties to recall the twisting route back to the entrance ladder anyway? Without breadcrumbs or guiding light, I'd only exile myself to slower doom, starving blindly in the dark once batteries died. Creeping slowly from my hiding place on quivering legs, I begin carefully retracing my original path inwards. Praying echolocation doesn't betray my movements again, counting each footstep and breath to mark fleeting seconds. My ears strain so acutely awaiting whispers of scuttling claws that I scarcely register the deadening silence surrounding me now. No more than a cautious handful of strides bring me parallel the side tunnel veering off towards the bunker's back-end maintenance areas, regions clearly still walked by that creature. Which is when a snarl shatters the corridor behind me. The creature has found me. Heavy footsteps rush my way. It knows I'm here now. There is nowhere to hide. I sprint away as the creature bursts from the shadows, racing after me with startling speed. Its disjointed limbs flail wildly to accelerate the misshapen body barreling down the passage towards me. My pounding heart drowns out the sound of my feet. As I race down the corridor, adrenaline floods my muscles, hurtling me forward as fast as desperation allows me. Pursuit echoes unrelenting behind, slavering grunts and claws finding traction against the concrete. The creature knows each twist of this place while I'm frantically guessing each turn, 
trying to recall the correct path upward. Rebar tangles through the rubble, snagging clothes in my scramble over the debris. I gasp, struggling not to rip my hands to shreds, prying free from the barbs. Tearing loose from the steel trap, I hurtle onward through the network of storage bays and maintenance rooms. The exit ladder must be somewhere ahead through the emergency lights, though the deeper I flee into the complex, the fainter those red beacons shine. Blackness waits to swallow any who wander down here, especially with death itself howling for my blood-only heartbeats behind. I risk a panicked glance back at the sound of toppling shelving, spotting a pale, sinuous shape writhing over the obstacles. Our race has carried me ahead for the moment, but such obstacles barely slow the creature's relentless pursuit. Its eyeless face undulates, sniffing voraciously to reacquire lost scent. Inside the sagging cowl of hair, jaws unclasp impossibly wide, as if to swallow prey whole once within reach. My gaze whips forward just in time to swerve left, saving my skull as the passage ends abruptly at a collapsed tunnel. Ancient wood planks bar further access, but a narrow gap promises safer passage beyond. I squeeze through without hesitation, leaving flesh and cloth behind on jagged edges, while the reaper itself claws after me. I spill awkwardly into the next hall, fighting not to fall face first from the unbalanced landing. Behind, a loud sound announces the monster is through, plowing heedless past the wooden spears. I spring to my feet and bolt on. Each frantic pump of limbs stretches distance again, but now bright emergency lamps directly ahead signal my nearing freedom. That glow taunts just one chamber farther down at the hall's end. Racing the last yards, I leap through crumbled concrete barriers only for softwood to disintegrate underfoot. My body plunges into darkness, hands snatching the splintered ledge as legs kick terrified emptiness. I clench every fiber to keep hold of this latest trap. Squinting down past my dangling heels reveals a twenty-foot pit directly under the tunnel. Painfully hoisting up again, my eyes meet the glow of daylight from above. Mere steps would have carried me to salvation before the wood walkway gave out. I twist my fingers into holds and heave my body left onto firmer wood planks set into the curving wall. Inches below, a clawed hand slashes the space my head just vacated. I recoil from needle tips, swiping against my hair, rolling clear along the ledge. Behind me, boards crack, then splinter loudly under the weight of the creature pulling itself fully over the brink. I throw a terrified glance back at the sound. In the shadows beyond the pit, a pale shape grows closer. In that suspended second, I know finally the true crushing despair of prey, that ultimate utterly overwhelmed by the shadow falling towards me, a whimper escapes my seizing throat. I cannot win and I cannot fight, yet still must choose the form of my ending. The only direction left to me is up or down. In the sacrifice of calculated odds, I choose down, launching off the ledge just as skeletal claws whisper past my nape. For one glorious instant, I believe I've slipped fate's snare. Soaring untouchable out into the freedom of the central shaft, my silhouette framed against dull light above. Then the triumph pitches into horror, watching the creature gather itself to spring from the ledge, arms coiling to snatch me from the air halfway down. But salvation takes the form of catastrophe. Old fixtures still bracketing the central tunnel choose that precise moment to give. The rusted remains of a ventilation shaft tear loose, plunging straight towards me. The force of that impact obliterates decades-old supports left decaying after this complex was initially abandoned. A deafening cascade launches behind my heels as the rim of the pit and exit led sheer completely away. Tons of concrete, wood, and rusted steel peel off the curved sides, plunging in my wake. And perched right atop the failing edge is the creature, skeletal arms grabbing at the crumbling footholds. For one split second, our eyes meet in unified shock at the reversal. It's my turn to gaze down while it struggles. With a final wrenching groan, the tunnel mouth gives way completely, plunging beast and debris together into the devouring dark. Their deafening descent reverberates off the wall, framing my motionless form still frozen against the pounding air gusts. I cling numb to jutting metal brackets, ears straining for long moments until the last echoes fade away. Only void answers back up from the tomb-like depths. My pulse gradually resumes, equal parts disbelief and all-consuming relief. 
twisting my neck upwards, I fixed desperate eyes on the glorious glow beckoning me onwards. Mustering the very last strength in my aching limbs, I begin dragging myself by fingertips and boot tips up the iron ladder. Twenty agonizing feet from the surface, a snap of rubble across concrete drifts up the ventilation shaft. My heart seizes once more. Putting my shoulder to the crumbling ladder frames, I climb upwards as fast as I can. The scrape of claws accelerates deafening up the concrete, amplified to an unbearable nightmare by the vent. Shards of broken boards and dangling cords whip my arms and face as I frantically climb. Then finally I reach the top. I throw my weight against the manhole cover in an effort to close it back up, metal edges screeching, refusing to align. Desperation forces the corroded seal centimeter by centimeter over the gap, but the last sliver still remains open when the creature heaves up against the underside. All my weight and effort remain insufficient to keep this hell gate closed. I wedge a broken plank scavenged from the debris between the steel hatch and crumbling stonework. For three seconds the wood slat groans yet holds, pinning back the jagged limb worming into the light. The creature thrashes rapidly against it. Not wasting precious seconds, I abandon the hole and bolt on trembling legs into daylight, struggling to catch my breath after the terrifying ordeal. My heart pounded against my ribs as my mind replayed the nightmarish images over and over, the haunting inhuman shrieks echoing through the concrete tunnels, the pale malformed creature bursting from the darkness, and all those endless moments spent blindly running through the pitch-black bunker. I shuddered, incredibly grateful to have somehow escaped that underground lair, and the unfathomable predator dwelling within. Glancing around my familiar comforting house, the warm sunlight now streaming through the windows seemed to mock the fresh visions of horror still lurking below in the woods. As the adrenaline rush began fading, the various scrapes and bruises sustained during my frantic escape started to register. Making my way to the bathroom, I winced at the swelling ankle and crusted blood from multiple nasty gashes. I gingerly peeled off my shredded pants to clean the dirt from my wounds. Kneeling down, shock coursed through me as I stared at the tattered skin surrounding my ankle. The normally red inflamed scratches appeared coated in an ominous dark substance. As I watched, thin veins of inky blackness seemed to spread slowly up my leg from the wound. The creature had touched me somehow during the chase. Could its claws or skin have transferred some kind of poison or parasite into me? The dark veins branching under my skin certainly seemed to suggest something now coursed through my bloodstream. Panic rising, I knew I needed medical help. I scrambled up and limped urgently to the kitchen counter across the hall where my cell phone waited. Snatching it up with a desperate prayer, my brief hope vanished. The phone screen was completely shattered, probably from being dropped or thrown against concrete during my blind escape. Worthless now, I slammed the dead device down. Feeling isolated and afraid, I peered out the back window, still able to glimpse the leaf-strewn grass hiding that fateful tunnel entrance. If that creature somehow tracked me back here, that entrance would surely be its first point of attack. Inspiration hit suddenly. I could try barricading the tunnel, blocking the path from its lair. That might at least delay the horror reaching me should it pursue my scent trail. I rummaged through the garage and yard shed, collecting any spare planks, boxes, and tools that might work to seal the tunnel. Dragging them awkwardly around the side of the house to the woods, I started desperately piling debris over the crumbling hole. But with my body growing weaker by the minute, even the smaller logs required leaning my whole body into moving across the grass. I awkwardly lined up each plank, nailing it haphazardly to its neighbor, slowly formed a makeshift seal over the entrance. My hammering pulses echoed through the woods until a loud snap interrupted me. I stopped, listening intently past my own ragged breaths. The snap repeated, followed by an earthy crunching drawing nearer. Tree limbs rustled violently off to my left. I peered desperately between the shadowy trunks but already knew in my pounding heart, framing my motionless form still frozen against the pounding air gusts. I cling numb to jutting metal brackets ears straining for long moments until the last echoes fade away. Only void answers back up from the tomb-like depths. My pulse gradually resumes, equal parts disbelief and all-consuming relief. Twisting my neck upwards, I fix desperate eyes on the glorious glow beckoning me onwards. Mustering the very last strength in my aching limbs, 
I begin dragging myself by fingertips and boot tips up the iron ladder. Twenty agonizing feet from the surface, a snap of rubble across concrete drifts up the ventilation shaft. My heart seizes once more. Putting my shoulder to the crumbling ladder frames, I climb upwards as fast as I can. The scrape of claws accelerates deafening up the concrete, amplified to an unbearable nightmare by the vent. Shards of broken boards and dangling cords whip my arms and face as I frantically climb. Then finally I reach the top. I throw my weight against the manhole cover in an effort to close it back up, metal edges screeching, refusing to align. Desperation forces the corroded seal centimeter by centimeter over the gap, but the last sliver still remains open when the creature heaves up against the underside. All my weight and effort remain insufficient to keep this hellgate closed. I wedge a broken plank scavenged from the debris between the steel hatch and crumbling stonework. For three seconds the wood slat groans yet holds, pinning back the jagged limb worming into the light. The creature thrashes rabidly against it. Not wasting precious seconds, I abandon the hole and bolt on trembling legs into daylight, struggling to catch my breath after the terrifying ordeal. My heart pounded against my ribs as my mind replayed the nightmarish images over and over, the haunting inhuman shrieks echoing through the concrete tunnels the pale malformed creature bursting from the darkness, and all those endless moments spent blindly running through the pitch-black bunker. I shuddered, incredibly grateful to have somehow escaped that underground lair, and the unfathomable predator dwelling within. Glancing around my familiar comforting house, the warm sunlight now streaming through the windows seemed to mock the fresh visions of horror still lurking below in the woods. As the adrenaline rush began fading, the various scrapes and bruises sustained during my frantic escape started to register. Making my way to the bathroom, I winced at the swelling ankle and crusted blood from multiple nasty gashes. I gingerly peeled off my shredded pants to clean the dirt from my wounds. Kneeling down, shock coursed through me as I stared at the tattered skin surrounding my ankle. The normally red inflamed scratches appeared coated in an ominous dark substance. As I watched, thin veins of inky blackness seemed to spread slowly up my leg from the wound. The creature had touched me somehow during the chase. Could its claws or skin have transferred some kind of poison or parasite into me? The dark veins branching under my skin certainly seemed to suggest something now coursed through my bloodstream. Panic rising, I knew I needed medical help. I scrambled up and limped urgently to the kitchen counter across the hall where my cell phone waited, snatching it up with a desperate prayer. My brief hope vanished. The phone screen was completely shattered, probably from being dropped or thrown against concrete during my blind escape. Worthless now, I slammed the dead device down. Feeling isolated and afraid, I peered out the back window, still able to glimpse the leaf-strewn grass hiding that fateful tunnel entrance. If that creature somehow tracked me back here, that entrance would surely be its first point of attack. Inspiration hit suddenly. I could try barricading the tunnel, blocking the path from its lair. That might at least delay the horror reaching me should it pursue my scent trail. I rummaged through the garage and yard shed, collecting any spare planks, boxes, and tools that might work to seal the tunnel. Dragging them awkwardly around the side of the house to the woods, I started desperately piling debris over the crumbling hole. But with my body growing weaker by the minute, even the smaller logs required leaning my whole body into moving across the grass. I awkwardly lined up each plank, nailing it haphazardly to its neighbor, slowly formed a makeshift seal over the entrance. My hammering pulses echoed through the woods until a loud snap interrupted me. I stopped, listening intently past my own ragged breaths. The snap repeated, followed by an earthy crunching drawing nearer. Tree limbs rustled violently off to my left. I peered desperately between the shadowy trunks but already knew in my pounding heart Nothing natural moved with such crashing force or speed from the basement's direction. Judging by the volume increasing each second, my barricade would be utterly insignificant against the power barreling through the forest, straight toward me. I abandoned the ineffective barrier and fled on wobbling legs back inside, scooping up the biggest kitchen knife as my sole remaining protection. Though still racked with confusion over how to possibly defend myself, some primal compulsion demanded action to brace against attack rather than paralyzing passivity. More deafening destruction erupted from the rear rooms. 
The creature had reached the house and was smashing violently up through the splintering floorboards. Heart lurching into my throat, I scraped aside living room furniture with hysterical urgency, piling the meager barricade against the doorway connecting to the kitchen. But the feeble lamps and chairs proved even more pitiful resistance. The makeshift blockade exploded apart. I retreated against the farthest wall in overwhelmed disbelief, clutching my cleaver in trembling hands. The beast would rip through that portal in mere seconds now. The creature ripped open the splintered basement door with a final enraged bellow, crashing into the debris-strewn room towards me faster than I could react in my rapidly weakening state. Its limbs swiped the feeble kitchen knife from my hands before bony claws could pierce my chest. I cried out as those jagged talons dug into my shoulders and instantly numbness spread down my torso. More of the inky toxin clearly now flooded into me from fresh wounds. My vision started dimming at the edges. I struggled to remain conscious, staring directly into the creature's face. Where eyes should have resided on any natural beast, this horror boasted only smooth blank flesh peppered with scar tissue. Revulsion and resignation churned within me as I accepted this thing crafted from nightmares would be my demise. Just then, a blinding spotlight blazed through the shattered window frames, causing the creature to recoil from my limp body with an ear-piercing screech. I heard my name frantically called out by multiple unfamiliar voices over the chaos. Blinking through the bright light flooding my house, I witnessed the creature scramble away from the powerful beams now sweeping the room. Heavy footsteps stomped onto the splintered floorboards, as dozens of figures in full military gear rapidly stormed into the house. They barked urgent commands I could barely comprehend, splitting into teams with weapons drawn, advancing in textbook clearance maneuvers. The creature attempted to bolt for the basement exit, only to meet crackling electric restraints that dropped it to the ground instantly. More soldiers moved in, entangling it completely within electrified nets. My adrenaline drained fully away watching the hulking beast smothered and immobilized by the precisely coordinated squad. Soon, no signs of that otherworldly strength remained, only muffled whimpers echoing from within the layered containment. A fully armored trooper knelt beside me, carefully drawing infected blood samples from my neck as another field medic began disinfecting the myriad claw wounds searing my shoulders. Their voices sounded oddly muffled between my fading consciousness and the helmets masking all facial features dragging my mind below the pain and alarm temporarily. Eventually I awoke hours, maybe days later, in a sterile medical isolation chamber. Various tubes fed into my arm from hanging IV bags containing liquids in unnaturally vivid hues. Thick pane glass surrounded the hospital bed on all sides, preventing any contact with whoever observed me through the opaque surface. Attempting to rise sent the room into dizzying spins, so I collapsed back. Some unknown stretch of time later, my dull senses perceived the sealed door sliding open. A tall man entered wearing an unmarked black suit, surveying me for a silent moment before speaking. You've been unconscious for two days after we extracted you from the specimen's attack. No doubt you are feeling quite bewildered about all this. He curtly explained I had suffered substantial blood toxicity from the escaped specimen's claws. However, emergency teams responded fast enough to administer monoclonal antibodies after extracting me once a distress signal was triggered. That unapproved experiment was an aging Cold War biochemical weapon we, unfortunately, revitalized despite its pending humane termination. Our cleanup responsibility is concluded, he said, keeping his eyes trained on me. In exchange for my full non-disclosure, the shadow agent continued while producing a medical document for signature. Their division would provide ample financial compensation both for undergoing hazardous environmental exposure and to discourage any public speculation over conspiracy theories. If you sign this non-disclosure agreement, our division will compensate you substantially for this ordeal and ensure you avoid any uncomfortable scrutiny over speculating on such matters publicly. He concluded by congratulating my lucky survival before a medical team transported me quietly to finish convalescing at a remote department facility. You ought to be proud of surviving such an encounter. Very few live to tell about it. And none who do, of course. We will get you patched up nicely somewhere more quiet before sending you home with a nice token of thanks, he said. My physical recovery progressed smoothly while psychological adaptation went less so. 
The layers of confidentiality agreements signed before discharge brought some financial security but little true closure. Officials remained vague regarding the creature's fate, only repeating assurances of it being contained under specialized conditions no longer my concern. The evening an unmarked truck dumped me outside my little country house again. I harbored no doubts. The nondescript sedan parked down the road contained surveillance members charting my conformity for some clandestine file. The house itself revealed no traces indicating government breach or creature intrusion after losing consciousness that horrific night. No local friends or family ever received the full story of what transpired beneath our rural community thanks to binding contracts. For the residents of this peaceful small town will sleep soundly tonight, as they have for decades prior. Entirely oblivious to the machine operating within the shadows tasked with occasionally confronting nightmares distilled into reality, or dispensing amnesia to preserve the greater illusion should such things slip their case.